Welcome to the second episode in a Legendarium series about the 12th century Renaissance. In this episode about the medieval universities, we will talk about how a changing world led to a new system of education in the form of the universities. After talking about life in these medieval universities, we will talk about how they revived Roman law and created a new theory of medicine. The Dark Ages wound up with its name because of the many social upheavals which, for a time, caused a general breakdown in social and political order. Europe suffered from not one but three major crises. The fall of the West Roman Empire, the disastrous consequences of the Krakatoa eruption in 536, and then the Viking invasions and near simultaneous collapse of the Carolingian Empire. By the 10th century, strong feudal lords began to re-establish a stable, if inequitable, social order. Ambitious peasants, hoping to move up the steps of the social order, might join a textile guild or head to the German frontier. But by the start of the 12th century, education came to be seen as a path to a better station in life for oneself and one's children. However, the old cathedral and monastic schools didn't have the room for the huge numbers of aspiring scholars showing up. So these students went to the cities, where a master could probably be found. However, the solution soon led to new problems. Teachers had trouble collecting fees from impoverished students. Some who claimed to be scholars were nothing but fakers out to cheat students. And even worse, the students were badly treated by the local townspeople, who saw them as outsiders to be cheated and perhaps driven out. To solve these problems, local notables created the first universities. In the years that followed, the great universities of the era came into being like Oxford, Paris, and Bologna. Students began their careers in the Faculty of Arts, studying grammar, rhetoric, arithmetic, geometry, and music. While some lectures from masters occurred, most education took place in the form of disputations, where students would be asked many questions and forced to defend their answer with perfect logic. In these new universities, students took advantage of Greek and Latin translations of classical texts produced by Muslim scholars. These works included Roman law, the Latin classics, and the works of the Church Fathers. The most eager traveled to Muslim-ruled Spain and Constantinople to obtain Greek manuscripts and find new fountains of knowledge to drink from. After three years, a successful student received a Bachelor of Arts. Another year or two later, he earned a Master of Arts. And after a few years more, he could receive a Doctorate of Philosophy or Jurisprudence and then enter the higher faculty of the university. Of course, it wasn't all scholarship. The court rolls of university towns filled with complaints about students' rowdy behavior like gambling and drinking and street fighting. With many students of different nationalities gathered together, rivalries soon erupted between English, French, German, and Italian students, which often turned into violent brawls, sometimes in the lecture halls. Perhaps in part because of this, townspeople often grew to resent the students, leading to yet more street violence. As if that weren't enough, students often quarreled with their masters about the cost of room and board, the content of their courses, and many students questioned if the university was really giving them their money's worth. While many graduates sought to attach themselves to a patron, either a noble lord or the church, some students failed to find work after graduation and wound up becoming wandering scholars, going from place to place in search of employment. The most luckless of all gathered in the taverns to drown their sorrows in wine. Yet there were graduates who thrived, especially those who went into the law. In earlier centuries, those who attended church schools became clergymen. And while many university graduates still went into the church, the study of law became increasingly prestigious and profitable, especially since kings and lords hoped to find legal advisors not tied to the church. Italy, where Roman law endured, became the center of legal studies, with Emerius of Bologna becoming the first great teacher of law. He emphasized careful reading of texts to understand how law could apply to any situation. Another scholar named Gratian became the first scholar to codify Roman law. 
During the 12th century, the lawyer took his place in government. Kings and feudal lords not only wanted to get legal advice without becoming too dependent on the church, but they also wanted to revive Roman law so they could more effectively govern their realms, didn't lose money to corrupt officials, and create a uniform system of laws that didn't rely on a hundred different sets of local customs. A specialist scholar called a glossator studied the original Greco-Roman texts and pulled out the bits that applied to life 700 years after the fall of Rome. Italian scholars spread Roman law as far as France, Spain, and England. Yet the new wave of scholarship didn't just affect law, it also affected medicine. The writings of the Greek physicians Galen and Hippocrates inspired medieval doctors to create a theory of the human body related to the four elements. They believed that four bodily humors corresponded to the four elements, with blood for earth, phlegm for air, yellow bile for fire, and black bile for water. It was believed that by keeping the four humors in balance, a person could keep good health. If the four humors fell out of balance, then illness would be the result. Doctors diagnosed sickness by studying bodily fluids, like urine, blood, and sometimes stool. Medical students were warned about patients trying to fool them by giving them someone else's urine. One popular medieval story tells the tale of a lord who gave urine from a pregnant servant girl, and after studying it, the doctor proclaimed that his lordship would soon perform a miracle by having a baby in less than a month. Astrology was also used to diagnose illness, with the doctor studying the stars to determine an ailment. Students were also taught that earthquakes, unburied corpses, decaying crops, and stagnant water poisoned the air, creating a disease causing miasma. While some of these ideas have been disproven, doctors could still set broken bones, correct sprained joints, remove bone fragments from fractured skulls, and take cataracts from eyes with silver needles. And that wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you saw, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and have a great rest of the day.